Yeah, that seems to work. Okay. Well, I think we can start right now. Uh, I'm very impressed that so many people of you arrived, even if we are in exam time right now. So maybe some of you have to learn, but I'm happy that you are here. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, I'd like to welcome you all, in, uh, also in the name of the, all the organizers, like the Institute for Computer Science, the Study Association for Math and Computer Science, and from my part, from the Kaustreff Osnabrück. Um, I'm really happy that we uh, have invited Roland tonight. Roland is uh, associate professor at the University of Twente in the DAX group. His research is mostly on DNS security and uh, internet protocols. Mm -hmm. And he's also a principal researcher at uh, NL Labs. Uh, you probably know this from uh, the Unbound DNS server. It's an open source software project that is mostly maintained by NL Labs. And Roland will tonight uh, give us a talk on DNS privacy and the problems uh, that we have in the protocol right now. And we will have a critical look at some new technologies uh, coming up in the sector. And yeah, please give a round of applause for Roland. Okay. Thank you, Eric. Can everybody, is this working? I, because I really can't hear, okay, perfect. That also means that the recording is working. Um, thank you, Eric, for introducing me. And also, uh, it's really nice to be here. So thank you for having me. I am a little bit um, ill. So um, if I look a little bit woozy, that's just because I got up this morning and I felt a little bit bad. But I'm still here. So um, I'm going to be talking uh, about DNS privacy. And I will explain. I will try to explain it like from A to Z. Uh, and if you have any questions, feel free to sort of to wave your hand. You can also hold them until the end of the talk. I really don't care. Uh, but if you, if you have a, an urgent question, just interrupt me and ask, right? So let's make it a little bit interactive. Uh, so Eric already said, I am an associate professor at University, uh, University of Twente. So that's just across the border here. It's about 100 kilometers from here. Uh, and I'm principal scientist at the Nelnet Labs. So we are a not-for-profit, so I'm not there for the money. Um, where we develop open source software for core internet protocols, and it's not just the DNS, but also for routing security, uh, so uh, RPKI. And we do uh, research on internet protocols, and that's mostly my job. Um, so I will talk about uh, uh, privacy in a domain name system, and I want to show you uh, the complexity of privacy in real-world internet protocols, and it's not that it's not very trivial, and that... Some things that are introduced for privacy with the best intentions have consequences that might be not be that nice. Um, so we start with the obligatory slide with Edward Snowden on it. Um, I guess I don't have to explain who that guy is. You all know him. Um, but um, one of the things that came out when there were the Snowden revelations is that even though everybody knew that the DNS has privacy issues, um, because it's a protocol that was introduced in the early days of the public internet in the 1980s. It's all clear text. It's all over a simple UDP and TCP transport, no encryption, nothing. Um, the Snowden re re revelation showed to what extent the DNS was being abused by the Five Eyes intelligence services. They were using it to redirect people to phishing. They were using it to figure out what people were surfing for. It was intercepted en masse. Um, I'm not going to go into the details, but uh, have a look at some of the programs that the NSA uh, ran, and a lot of them uh, were abusing the DNS in some way. Right, so that meant that even though everybody knew we had a problem with the DNS, and people had already started thinking about how we could improve on it, this made clear we really had to do something. Um, you're not laughing? Good. Um, when I pop this slide up uh, in other audiences, they laugh when I say IETF to the rescue. I don't know. Have, has any one of you ever been to an IETF? No. no. You have? You have. Okay, in the back. Okay, good. So maybe you, you can see the, the humor in IETF to the rescue because nothing happens fast in the IETF, right? People talk forever and forever and forever, and then they come up with a new standard, and then it takes forever to roll out the new standard, right? So that's a bit of a problem. In... 2014, uh, they established, uh, they took a lot of action post Snowden, but for DNS specifically, they started the DNS Private Exchange Deprive Working Group. Uh, and it's actually a working group that I'm active in as well. 
Uh, and uh, one of the things that they wanted to do was to really improve the privacy of the DNS uh, and to propose protocol changes. And they started uh, by first identifying the problems that exist in the DNS. And there is uh, this RFC 7626. Um, I don't know, can, Eric, can I share the slides at some point with you so you can distribute it? So if you, if you want to look at some of the references I have, you can do that. Now, what this does, who, know, who knows what an RFC is before I talk about stuff that nobody understands? OK, about half the room. OK, so an RFC is a standards document for the internet. Uh, it's that uh, the, the, the abbreviation means request for comments. It's, uh, it was introduced a very, very long time ago. Um, we just had the 100th ITF two years ago. Um, and uh, an RFC is, uh, there are several four types of RFCs, but typically it specifies some sort of uh, internet standard. So it specifies um, how the protocol is made up, how systems communicate with each other. Uh, but it can also be uh, an analysis of a problem. And this RFC is an analysis of all of the privacy risks that exist in the DNS. Um, what I'm going to focus on is client to resolver traffic. And don't worry if you don't know how DNS works, I will have a slide on that. Here we go. Um, this is the DNS. Or rather, this is a very simplified picture of the DNS. Um, with on the left-hand side, you with your, OK, I sh that there should have been many more phones here. But let's assume you all have laptops. You on that side. Then um, somewhere there is an internet service provider that will probably here be the university. You're, you're probably all on Edge Rome. Uh, and you have a DNS server, and what a DNS server does is it translates human-readable names into machine-readable IP addresses. And um, because that involves talking to lots of other machines on the internet, this is outsourced to what is called a DNS resolver. So your computer doesn't normally do this itself, but it outsources it to something that sits on the network and does that for you. That is called a DNS resolver. Um, and so for today, I'm going to be talking about this part of the protocol. So how your client talks to a DNS resolver. I'm not going to be talking about how that DNS resolver talks to what are called authoritative name servers on the internet. There is stuff going on there as well, but that's not relevant for this talk. Is that clear for everybody? Does, it, does this sort of make sense? For those of you less familiar with DNS, name mapped to IP address, that's what it does. OK. Actually, though, nowadays, the picture looks slightly different. Um, because we have this, maybe, side channel. Um, because we now have public DNS services, like Google 8888, familiar to people. Uh, we have 9999, which is supposedly privacy friendly. We have Cloudflare with 1.1.1.1. And these are increasingly popular. More and more and more people are using these to do their DNS resolving. Uh, and actually what that does, it really circumvents everything that we used to have before with your DNS resolver in your network that you used to talk to. You now talk to these people in the cloud, because the cloud is, of course, always better. Um, before we dig into that, so uh, remember that, right? In the, right now, the situation is you talk to something in your local network. That will mostly be the case here, unless you specifically configured your device to talk to Google or to Cloudflare or to whatever. Um, but that is changing. And I'll get to that about halfway during the talk. So bear with me on that. Now, what uh, the people in the IETF realized is that there should be changes to how we do DNS resolving to make it more uh, privacy friendly. And there are two behavior changes that help with privacy. And the first one is called uh, query name minimization. And I'll show you what that looks like in a minute, um, where the DNS resolver, when it's talking to the internet, limits the information it shares with other servers. And there are uh, uh, caching measures, which I'm not really going to talk about. But right now, one of the roles of this resolver is that if it gets a response, it keeps it in a cache for a while. And if somebody else asks the same question, it gives a response from the cache, rather than going to the internet and finding out what that name maps to. 
Um, and you actually leak a little bit of information every time the resolver has to go out to the internet to figure out what a name is if it doesn't have it in its cache. And there are some measures that you can take to make your cache work a little bit better. Now, query name minimization. On the left, this is how DNS resolving works uh, in the classic protocol from 1983. Um, so say I want to know the, what this name, a.b.example.com, I'm looking for an A record, uh, which is uh, the address record, so the IPv4 address that goes with that name. Uh, and if I want to resolve that, the first step I do is I send a query to the root of the DNS, all the way at the, the top, uh, and I ask it if it has an address for a.b.example.com. And, and the root says, I don't know, but I'm, I'm giving you some name service for .com. Maybe you can ask them. So again, I go, here we go, I, I ask a.b.example.com, I ask the .com name servers, do you know what the address is for a.b.example.com? And the .com ser name servers, of course, don't know, and I get another referral to uh, the example.com name servers, and I ask them, and they have an example for me. Uh, they, they have the answer for me. Now, what is wrong with this picture is that I'm telling everybody in the DNS what I'm interested in. I'm interested in this name. I'm telling everyone. But they really don't need to know. So what they did with query name minimization is what you see on the right in blue, um, it becomes a lot more complex, but if I want to resolve the name a.b.example.com, I start by asking the root what it knows about .com, because that's what I need to know to answer the next part of that question. So you make the resolving process a lot more complicated, but you leak less information, and especially to the operators of the top-level domain, so com, or in Germany, DE, or in the Netherlands, .nl, they learn a lot about what people are interested in because every time there is a full recursion, you leak some information. Um, and the nice thing about query name minimization is that that is actually already seeing quite a bit of deployment. Uh, it is supported by Quad1 and Quad9, so uh, Cloudflare and uh, Quad9 is run by Packet Clearinghouse. Uh, but also, for example, the National Research Network that we have in the Netherlands does it on its resolvers, um, because I used to work for Surfnet and I installed that. Um, and, but uh, uh, there are others that do it too, like Access for All is a very popular internet provider in the Netherlands. Um, they've been in the news lately because our local telco incumbent is, selling, is uh, killing them off as a brand, which no, people don't like. Um, but they also deploy this stuff. And maybe uh, there are actually online tests that you can run to check if your resolver does that. So you can check if your resolver here does that, for example. Uh, what you see uh, in the graph is from uh, uh, a measurement that we do with uh, RIPE Atlas probes. Do people know what RIPE Atlas is? Who knows, Hans? Oh, not a lot of people. OK, one. <laughs> um, do people know what RIPE is? Hans? Oh, not a lot of people either. Okay. So, RIPE is the organization that hands out IP addresses in Europe and the Middle East. Uh, so, if you are an ISP and you need new IP addresses, you go to RIPE and you say, hey, I need new IP addresses, and they give them to you, if there are still IPv4 addresses left. Um, but they also run this project called RIPE Atlas, and they make small... Um, like um, uh, like Raspberry Pis, I guess you'd say. They're, they're, they're small boxes that you can connect to your local network, and they serve as probes that researchers can, can use to do measurements from all sorts of networks. And there are uh, roughly uh, 11,000 of these probes all over the world, although there are far more in Europe and there are far more in the US than in the rest of the world, but they are sort of spread out across the globe. And what we do is we do a measurement to see if the DNS resolvers that these probes use support query name minimization. And that's what you see here in the graph, the, the green part. And this graph starts in 2017, when the protocol had only just been introduced, and it runs until a couple of days ago, because I put the graph in a couple of days ago. So it's slowly going up. One of the takeaways from this is it takes a heck of a long time if you make this new protocol, such a new protocol, it takes a really long time before that gets rolled out across the internet, right? Because you can see that at, uh, um, far less than half of the uh, resolvers that the RIPE Atlas probes see support the protocol. 
Um, and you have to also keep in mind that this is sort of a biased measurement because people that put RIPE Atlas probes in their networks are geeks that already care about network security. So there will be bias in this data. No, well, so you ask them for the full name, but when they go out on the internet to resolve that name for you, they use this protocol. So they, they, they do query name minimization, so they only tell .com that you're interested in .com, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. yeah. Now, the other thing, and the other obvious thing that you can do to improve privacy is to encrypt the traffic. Um, and um, for that, we have what is called RFC 7858, uh, and it is a very simple idea. We let the stub, which is the, the, the bit of DNS that is in your device or in your laptop, that talks to the DNS resolver. We let that talk to the resolver over a TLS connection. Um, that means that anybody who is on the network can no longer intercept your communication with them. And that communication is, of course, very revealing about you because every name that you, every website you visit has lots of names associated with it. And if I can see which DNS queries you ask, I know which website you're visiting, right? I know you're going to Facebook, or you're going to Tinder, or you're going to some other dating website. It's very, very revealing. Um, and basically, the other people on the network shouldn't know. Only the DNS resolver should know that you're interested in these questions, right? Especially if, for example, if you are in, say, a Starbucks, or like me, you're in the hotel here, which has an open Wi-Fi network, Anybody who connects to that, and if you do DNS resolving, you don't use some sort of encryption, can see what you are surfing for. Um, there was this guy in the Netherlands. So in the Netherlands, we have free Wi-Fi on trains. Uh, and the SSID is called Wi-Fi in the train, which is his Wi-Fi on the train. Uh, and uh, there was this guy in Amsterdam who had a houseboat that sits uh, 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 in the water just along the railway track that goes from Utrecht to Amsterdam. And Utrecht is the largest railway station in the Netherlands. A lot of traffic goes from there to other parts of the country. And of course, a lot of trains go to Amsterdam. And what he did was he put two huge antennas on his houseboat uh, and uh, listened for traffic on this SSID. Uh, and just tracked people in the, that were using this with their phones or their other devices on the train, uh, listened to their DNS queries to figure out what they were surfing for, tracked their MAC addresses. Um, so he could figure out that there was always the same iPhone on the same train at the same time going towards Amsterdam, and uh, these people were always looking at Facebook or something else. Right? So it's extremely revealing. Um, you can at least solve part of that problem by doing DNS over TLS. Then he wouldn't be able to tell what names you're asking for. He can still see the, the connections you're making, but at least he doesn't know which names you're interested in. Now, if you introduce something like this, it does raise some issues because DNS is a protocol from the 1980s. It was very efficient. It uses UDP, which is not connection oriented. So I fire off one packet, I get one packet back in return, that's it. it that's extremely efficient and extremely fast. For TLS, I have to establish a connection. I have to do some negotiation about which cryptographic algorithms I'm going to use for the connection. And only then can I start talking. And if I have to set up uh, such a connection for every question I ask, that's not very efficient. Now, there are some ways that we can solve that. There is uh, a faster way of opening TCP connections. There is what is called TLS session resumption. If I had a connection to a TLS server before, I can reuse some of the information that I had to talk to it again. But that has a privacy problem because it makes me trackable. So it's not trivial to introduce something like that. Another problem is, of course, resource consumption. The DNS resolver has a limited amount of CPU power. If some of that CPU power goes to establishing cryptographic handshakes, uh, it's, not go it's going to be able to resolve fewer queries at the same time, so it becomes slower. Generally speaking, though, this works really well, and it's actually already quite well supported. Now, another thing that you have to keep in mind, and I, I, I really want to share some of the details with you. I hope some of you get it. If you don't, don't worry about it. 
One other thing is padding. If I encrypt traffic and I uh, communicate, then the size of the packet also says something about the questions I'm asking and the answers I'm getting back. Uh, what you see on the right is a plot of, uh, on the um, x-axis, we have the, the, the DNS query size, so the size of the packet that I send to the resolver, and on the y-axis is the size of the response. And as you can see, there's quite a bit of spread in there. Uh, and if I throw some machine learning at it, I can actually figure out quite accurately what people are surfing for. So what they said was they introduced something called eDNS zero padding. You don't have to know the details about that. But what you do is if you, t if you have a packet that you send towards a resolver or, if they, or they send you a packet back, they just add some useless crap to the packet to make it bigger so that all pick packets are the same size and you can no longer determine what is in that packet by simply analyzing the size. These are things that you have to consider if you're updating these protocols. Um, and uh, people in the ITF can talk about this for ages, for these kinds of things. <laughs> but is this not already the normal behavior of, of uh, TLS to add some padding on the um, package? Maybe I should repeat the question for the stream. So the question is if, if, the, if this is not standard behavior for TLS. Um, no, it isn't. So to a certain extent, of course, it will try to put multiple uh, uh, datagrams in, single, in a single packet or in a single frame. But DNS is, I, I ask one uh, question and I get one answer back. So for DNS, that doesn't work very well because I'm constantly sending only a single datagram back and forth. Um, so maybe, f of course, TLS tries to be efficient, so it tries to pack multiple datagrams in a single packet, but that doesn't work for DNS. Yeah. Could uh, uh, DNS resolving also be prone to timing attacks? Uh, in what way? Like, uh, it, it takes different answering times uh, depending on which uh, domain was asked for. Okay, so the, so the question is, based on how long it takes before you get a response, could you tell what people are asking for? Um, maybe, probably, probably, probably not. If the population of the resolver is big enough, if there are enough people asking it questions, the cache will be very efficient. So on a busy resolver, you expect typical uh, cache hit ratio of in the order of 90%. That means that 90% of the answers come from the cache. Uh, and this is what typical large operators with thousands of users on a single DNS resolver see. And in that case, timing doesn't really work. If you are only very few people on the network, of course, this is different because the likelihood that the answer is not in the cache becomes bigger, and then you might, might be able to tell. There is, however, another issue with DNS over TLS. Um, there are also legitimate reasons to intercept DNS traffic, uh, and this is for security monitoring. Um, for example, my university uses a, a system called QuarantaineNet, uh, uh, which uh, monitors DNS traffic to see if people are infected with uh, malware or ransomware or whatever. And if you are, they take your machine and they put it in a different subnet, uh, and all you can do on that subnet is find instructions on how to disinfect your machine. <laughs> And the problem is, of course, if we encrypt the traffic, that no longer works. That means we have to do something different. Um, we have to start monitoring traffic on the DNS resolver itself, which is, of course, still possible. Uh, but it means that a lot of the systems that are out there that we use now need to be changed. Another issue is that we have not that much experience in production with the resource requirements. So, so uh, can I get to you in a minute? When I, I just finished this and then, yeah. Uh, the resource requirements, so uh, how big does the system need to be to handle all of these TLS connections? Um, now the fact that somebody like Google is running that in production or somebody like Cloudflare is running that in production is all nice and fine, seems to suggest that this is doable. But remember, these people run web services. They are very familiar with um, doing lots of encrypted traffic. And your typical DNS operator is an internet service provider that had a DNS server that basically works very much the same way it did in 1980, that now suddenly becomes a completely different machine. You, you had a question?
Yeah. Well, so what we have to do is we can no longer intercept the DNS traffic on the wire. What we have to do is we have to look in the resolver what the question is it's getting, which is possible, but it requires a change. Um, the other thing is that DNS over TLS runs on a dedicated port. So DNS runs on port 53. Uh, DNS over TLS runs on port 853, which makes it really easy to block. Um, so that makes DNS over TLS unavailable, and if people still want to use the internet, they need DNS, so they will default to using unencrypted DNS. So where are we with DNS over TLS? Um, it is actually already really well supported in Resolver software. All of the popular implementations, so Unbound, which is the one that NLN Labs makes, but also Bind, not Resolver, and PowerDNS, those are the big resolvers on the market. They all support this. To be honest, I don't know if the Windows DNS Resolver supports it, but I, I wouldn't be surprised if it does. No, they, uh, they don't support it? Yes. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I'm not going to comment on that. Um, so, and client support is actually also really good. Um, if you have Android P or up, I don't know, if are they at Q yet or, or maybe even beyond Q? Uh, but from Android P, they support uh, DNS over TLS by default. And uh, if you have Android P, it will try to talk to the local resolver on your network using DNS over TLS first, so opportunistically. And if that works, it will keep talking securely to the resolver on your network. Um, other end users, there's, there's Get DNS Stubby. The picture of the dog is Search and Stubby. He was a mascot of British uh, airmen in, the, in World War II. Um, and the, the project is named after the dog. Don't ask me why. Uh, it was Englishmen that implemented it. Um, the, that is something you can install on your, on your end uh, end user system if you want to use DNS over TLS. Um, and service providers are also increasingly supported. All of the public cloud resolvers support this. Uh, and for those of you who are Linux users, uh, systemd resolveD supports this. Now, now I'm going to duck because people hate systemd, but... No. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, so what are some next steps in DNS over TLS? We really need to get more experience, right? So this protocol has already uh, been there for three or four years, but uh, it's still in its infancy in terms of deployment. Um, and for example, things like uh, out-of-order processing. If I do DNS over UDP, I fire off a packet, and then I don't wait until I get a response. I can do something else. I can fire off another packet or answer another question. And then at some point, the response comes back, and I'm happy, and I give the response to the client. For DNS over TLS, I set up a connection, I ask a question, I have to wait until the response comes back, and then I answer my client. Um, what you can do is you can actually keep that channel open for a while, and then you can do this asynchronous querying again. But it requires you to keep your connection open, so you have to do some connection management, and again, your software becomes more complex. The amount of code we had to add to Unbound for doing this was actually significant. Um, we are now, uh, oh, here I have systemd resolve to support it. So we are now also looking at whether we should use TLS to talk to the authoritative name servers on the internet. So those are the people that know the answers for a single domain, like the people that know all the answers for .com or all the answers for example.com, whether we should be talking TLS to those people. But nobody really knows whether that will scale. Um, the people that run .com and .net, VeriSign, are really reluctant to encourage this because uh, they will have to in significantly invest in hardware. Um, because to give you some idea, the .com name servers get in the order of 200 billion queries per day. Uh, and if you suddenly do all of that over TLS, um, you need bigger hardware. <laughs> now... Um, Remember that encrypting traffic makes monitoring really harder. Because I have time, what I want to show you is uh, a potential solution for this. And we use some really old technology to uh, make a privacy-friendly way of doing threat detection in a network. And this was actually tested in production at the National Research Network in the Netherlands. Um, and what we do is we use something called bloom filters. Is anybody here familiar with bloom filters? 
only one? You don't, you, didn't, you don't have an algorithms course that you follow, maybe? Um, Bloom filters were developed in the 1970s when computers were really, really slow. And people needed something to speed up database lookups. Uh, and what Bloom filters are, they are like a set of elements with a probabilistic membership test. Now, what does that mean? If I want to find out if some element n is in a set b, then if the answer to that question uh, uh, is no, then n is guaranteed not to be in b. If the answer to that, that is yes, then it's highly likely that n is in b, but there is a small probability that it isn't. Uh, and we can actually use this. This was intended as a fail-fast way to do lookups in databases, right? If you want to figure out if some value is in the database and it isn't, you want to know fast because then you can stop searching and if, if the searching is inefficient. How does that work? Say I have a domain name, www.example.com, and I run that through a hash function. Uh, who, who here does not know what a hash function is? Good. Uh, <laughs> so we run that through a hash function and we get a hash value out of that and then we extract some indices from that and we use those indices to toggle bits in a bit array, in a really large bit array. And what does that look like? Um, if I do www.example.com, uh, I run it through the hash, then I get three indices in, in this bit array, which is a toy bit array of eight values. Uh, and I set those values to one. Um, and this is example.org, and because this is a different name, I get a different hash, and I hit different indices in the bit array. If I want to do a lookup, I repeat the process. So if I want to look up www.example.com, I run it through the hash, I look at the indices, and if they are set to one, then there is a, uh, that, then it's likely that I inserted www.example.com into that Bloom filter. Um, if at least one of the bits is set to zero, I can be sure I never inserted that ele element, so that's why uh, if the answer is no, then I never inserted that element. Um, now, you, you have a small false positive probability, um, so falsepositive.org happens to hit these bits, and they were already set by something else. So even though I never inserted falsepositive.org, I still get the answer, yes, it is in there. So that's the, like the false positive probability. Now, the idea behind this is what we do is we insert all queries from clients of a resolver. So say, let's say, assume all of you are using one resolver. We insert all of your queries if you're going to Facebook, Twitter, uh, the CCC website. Uh, we insert all of those queries into a Bloom filter. And then after, and we can check afterwards if a name was queried for, which for threat detection is really useful, um, but not who asked the question not exactly when they asked it, but this is sufficient for network level threat monitoring. So uh, take, for example, are you all familiar with the WannaCry ransomware? So the WannaCry ransomware uh, queried for a very specific domain name, which was the kill switch. And if that domain name existed, the, the, the ransomware would, would disable itself. But you could also use this to detect the ransomware in the network, because if you see that DNS query, it means that there is an infected machine in your network. Um, and this type of monitoring can be used to detect that. Actually, when we deployed this in practice, we found a couple of um, uh, machines that were infected with WannaCry that we hadn't spotted before. Um, what is really nice about these Bloom filters is that they're non-enumerable. As soon as I put something in, I have no way of figuring out what I originally put in because I ran something through a hash, I toggled some bits. There is no way to map those bits back to the name that I put in. I can still randomly try lots and lots and lots of names, but if I start randomly trying, I up the chances of a false positive and it's really not useful. So you cannot enumerate them. If I put lots of users into a single filter, it becomes even harder to track people, right? If I just put all of the queries from one user in and I know who the user is, I can sort of start guessing. They probably visited Facebook. Oh, yeah, they did. Um, what's also really nice about these Bloom filters is that we can combine different filters with very simple mathematical operations. We can combine them. That means, for example, if we populate a new filter, say, once every hour, we start a new one every hour, that means that we can do detection over a period of an hour. But after, say, a week, 
we want to reduce that to one day. We just add up all the 24 bloom filters for that day and we get a bloom filter that covers one day. And that's really nice, you can aggregate them. Um, so we tested this for, for uh, three weeks on um, busy DNS resolvers at SurfNet. They have roughly 200,000 users, one of these, um, during daytime. Um, the graph shows you the queries per second. Um, what you can see is that we were running up to the summer holiday because the number of queries is going down. Um, and we studied three use cases. The detection of so-called booters. Who knows what booters are? Hands. Not very few, oh, very few people. Booters are DDoS as a service. I pay a few euros, I DDoS somebody. This comes from gaming. Um, that's why they're called booters, because you're booting somebody out of their game. Um, but it's actually used to bring down banks, uh, schools, uh, etc. And schools is the reason SurfNet was interested in that. There were students in the SurfNet network who were using booters to bring down their schools at exam time. Um, and of course, uh, we want to know if people query for those booters, but it seems a little bit privacy invasive to record everybody's queries to find this one student who is doing the, uh, the DDoS. Um, I'm going to talk about the last one, the National Detection Network. So in the Netherlands, we have uh, what is called the National Detection Network. It's, it's run by the Dutch National Cybersecurity Center, NCSC. And it's supposed to have really high value indicators of compromise um, from, for example, the intelligence services. Uh, so say there is a, a state level actor who's trying to uh, target universities. There was, a, uh, or for example, there is really new ransomware that is used against universities. Uh, one of our um, bigger universities in Maastricht in the south of the Netherlands was hit by a ransomware attack over Christmas. And they ended up having to pay the bad guys to decrypt their data. Um, there was a press conference about this yesterday, so there will be an English language report at some point. Um, it, that was very serious. Now the problem was that SurfNet could not monitor for these types of threats because the um, privacy officer said you can't just record everybody's DNS queries on the off chance that there might have been a threat in there at some point in the past. Which is entirely reasonable, right? Uh, why should we start tracking users uh, if they haven't done anything wrong? Uh, but now that we had this bloom filter approach, we could actually uh, do the monitoring without violating people's privacy. And we uh, took the indicators of compromise from this national detection network, ran them against the bloom filters, and uh, found actual compromise. WannaCry, mostly WannaCry infected machines. But WannaCry infected machines that nobody had spotted before. And because the kill switch existed, the ransomware hadn't activated, but the machines were still infected. Um, if you're interested, this Bloom filter stuff was released as open source. There, uh, we also wrote a paper about it where you can read more about it. Um, I'll share the slides, so don't worry about the, the URL. What is nice about this, we're actually, actually at the Nelnet Labs, we're, we're making sure that we can integrate this into Unbound in some way, so that you can do this type of privacy-friendly monitoring, because as, uh, as a not-for-profit, uh, open standards, open source organization, we believe in privacy. But we also realize that people need security. So now we can make security and privacy go hand in hand. You can still do privacy friendly uh, data collection, uh, but still give people uh, uh, better security. Yes? Well, it, it was a decision by the, the, the data protection officer of SurfNet, and of course it's within the context of the GDPR. Um, but actually this decision was made before the GDPR existed. Uh, but the Netherlands, just like Germany, already had a very strict privacy law. Uh, so our local privacy law, very much like in Germany, was already stricter than the GDPR. Um, and now we get to, uh, now we're about, uh, uh, we're about halfway, we get to uh, what we call Doe. And, and that's why I need Homer Simpson, because we are going to go talk about Doe. Anybody know what Doe is? Few people know what Doe is. Good. What's Doe? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> DNS over HTTPS. <laughs> um, remember, uh, Google 
actually had DNS over HTTPS for ages on 8888. Um, it was some sort of REST protocol, and people you had to you had some sort of JSON blob you send there, and then you got a response, and nobody used this. It was abandoned. And then people decided, people in the HTTP world decided they needed to, they could do DNS better. Uh, and they came up with an IETF draft, and things started moving really fast. Remember that I told you that the IETF uh, never comes to the rescue because they're so slow. This was weird because it was very fast. There was a working group formed to make DNS over HTTPS. September 2017, they had a draft. Then they, what is called a draft is a document that uh, can become an internet standard, but it is something that somebody writes. Um, and a draft doesn't progress until it's been adopted by a working group. This draft was adopted within a month, uh, which I think is a record for the ITF. But the RFC was published just a year later. Um, the people who know a little bit about the ITF, which is unfortunately only two people in the back of the room, know how fast this is. This is incredibly fast. Um, because there was a lot of momentum behind this idea. Why? Um, we'll get to that in a minute. What does DOH do? DOH takes a DNS message, which we used to send in the 1980s over UDP. It then base64 encodes this. Uh, and so it just takes the normal message that you would send over UDP, makes base64, and sends it over an HTTP get or an HTTP push. There are two modes of operation. There is dedicated, where the service endpoint only is a DOH resolver. And then there is mixed DNS, where you have a normal website, which happens to have a DOH endpoint somewhere in there. What this means is that you mix web traffic with DNS traffic, um, which from a privacy perspective is interesting, right? Because uh, it makes it really hard for me to block that DOH endpoint, because if I block that, I also block that maybe very popular website. It also means that if I see traffic, remember this is DNS over HTTPS, so it's encrypted. Is somebody asking the web server for a, a, a GIF with a cat in it? Or are they asking the lots of DNS questions? You can't tell. So from a privacy perspective, it's really interesting. How do you configure DOH? You just put a URL or a URI in your uh, endpoint which is way too complex for most users. Uh, I'll get to that in a minute. How did we get DOH? The browser community wanted a web-style API to access DNS. They wanted this for a long time because they can only write JavaScript. <laughs> um, sorry, I'm, I'm, this is, uh, for, are there old people that know what this is, an MSX computer? Z80, 8-bit computer, which has 16 kilobytes of RAM, maybe? where you need to program efficiently. The browser people can't do that. <laughs> um, but they are actually pushing this for several reasons. Because they say, oh, we want to enhance the privacy of browser users. Uh, because we need encrypted transport for uh, DNS. Um, we can also mix it with other HTTP traffic. So we hide it in the rest of the traffic. And oh, the adoption of this DNS over TLS is way too slow. Nobody's deploying this, so we need something that we can put in our browser so that it immediately works. Also, port 443 rarely gets blocked on networks. It's not entirely true because people put all sorts of hideous proxies on their network, but in general, it's less likely that that is blocked, unlike this port 853, which I can specifically block to block DNS over TLS. Um, they claim that they want to improve the user experience by reducing latency. I'll get to that in a minute. I, pff, this is nonsense. Uh, and uh, they want uh, uh, new features, doing stuff with JSON rather than Base64 encoded uh, stuff. Server push, so uh, be the Amazon of the DNS. Because you searched for Facebook.com, you might also be interested in Instagram.com. Here is the answer to that as well. <laughs> <laughs> and what they call resolverless. I will get to that in a minute. Now, um, in the rest of the talk, I will, finish, uh, I will talk about issues with DNS over HTTPS. Because DOH, and there are a lot of people that don't realize this, but it may have far-reaching consequences for the DNS, and if it has consequences for the DNS, it has consequences for the internet. And what we will look at is privacy 
issues for network operators. And the last one, and, and, and this is the one that many people miss, is the impact on the DNS namespace. Now, um, the people that like DOH argue that it brings you privacy. And there are some issues with that. Because DOH, in principle, has all of the privacy issues that HTTP has. User agent profiling, cookies, uh, uh, connection tracking, all of that. Um, so we have a whole new RFC, so an internet draft, just to deal with that stuff. Um, more insidiously, the people that do DOH uh, uh, advocate that you should be using a public trusted recursive resolver, TRR. Uh, that term will, if you start following this debate, you will see that term popping up, trusted recursive resolver. Uh, and what they basically argue, and this is something I'll, I'll talk about in a minute, but it's something that, that is uh, coming from mostly people in the US internet community. Why would I use Google or Cloudflare or Quad9 uh, instead of the um, resolver that my ISP provides? In the European Union, there's really no good reason to do that because the GDPR protects you against your ISP monetizing your surfing behavior. They can't do that legally, and you can take them to court if they do that. Uh, in the US, not so much. Another thing that they argue is that there is um, what is called NX domain hijacking. If you ask for a name and it doesn't exist, then the error code that you get back is called NX domain. Domain does not exist, non-existent domain. Um, People hijack that. So the DNS resolver of, for example, Deutsche Telekom, I don't know if they still do it, but the Deutsche Telekom used to do this. Uh, and um, you uh, were looking for something that doesn't exist. Maybe you're interested in one of these. Um, and this is, uh, is something that is very common in the US, uh, and it really annoys the people that are pushing the OH. Um, but actually, sure, Deutsche Telekom has a bad habit, but at least they can't monetize your surfing behavior because then they'd be violating the GDPR or the German privacy law, which is even more strict. Um, how many people know OpenDNS? Cisco Umbrella? Um, okay, so it's another public DNS resolver. And when they were new, this is how they made their money. So they made their money from advertising for people that mistyped a name. And the name didn't exist, and they would show you ads. I guess that's what T-Mobile is doing as well here. Uh, and uh, interestingly, OpenDNS has moved completely away from this, and they're now selling you a security service, which is why they were acquired by Cisco. Um, but it gets worse with uh, Mozilla. How many Firefox users in the room? Good, you should pay attention. Um... <laughs> Firefox, of course, prides itself on being independent, uh, conscious of privacy. It is the people from Mozilla that are pushing DNS over HTTPS the hardest. Um, and there has been a lot of debate on the internet. I don't know if any of you have seen this, but Firefox supports DOH, DNS over HTTPS, since version 61, but they enabled it by default in version 69. That was in, I think, in October last year. And their default trusted recursive resolver is Cloudflare. That means if you use Firefox, then it might have switched and started talking to Cloudflare. It will have notified you of this. Um, why do I say might? Because currently they claim that they are only deploying this for users in the United States. And I'm going to show you the pop-up dialogue that it shows, and I want to check if any of you, you have seen that pop-up dialogue. Um, but Firefox, uh, the Firefox people are really pushing this. They are saying, you cannot trust the resolver that your ISP gives you. You therefore must go to one that has a privacy policy. They actually have an agreement with Cloudflare. Uh, there, is a, there is a special privacy policy for the DNS over HTTPS endpoint that Firefox uses. That privacy policy is public. Uh, and if Cloudflare complies with that, it's actually a good privacy policy. The problem, of course, is, is that Cloudflare is an American company. And American companies are subject to the uh, 
No, not the Patriot. Yeah, the Patriot. It used to be subject to the Patriot Act, but the one that follows it, which I've forgotten the name of. National hmm? The National Security Letter. No, there. Yes, the National Security Letter is the instrument, but the 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 law that that this falls under is changed. It used to be the Patriot Act. People know the Patriot Act. That means that somebody can send a, uh, 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 the NSA or another intelligence agency can just send a request to Cloudflare and say, we want this data, and Cloudflare can't publicly acknowledge that they got such a letter, right? This is all secret. So personally, I don't want my data to go to Cloudflare, especially not sensitive data like DNS surfing behavior, because you learn a lot about me if you know the names I ask for. Uh, you know that I'm interested in 8-bit computers. Um, <laughs> So Firefox is taking a big step there because they're making this choice on behalf of their users because they're saying our users can't decide this for themselves. We want to protect them, so we're going to do this for them. Um, I personally take issue with that because I do know what I'm doing and I don't want Firefox to decide this for me. Other browsers are taking a different approach. Chrome also supports DOH and if Chrome supports it, so does Edge. Um, and probably at some point Safari, but Apple is lagging behind again. Um, but what they do is, if the resolver that you get configured on your system, if that is on a whitelist and they know it supports DOH, then they will talk DOH, so they will automatically encrypt the DNS traffic if they know your resolver supports it, but they're not going to send it to Google by default. Now that sounds, maybe sounds a little bit weird, but Google has lots of enterprise customers and enterprise people don't want DNS to get hijacked because they use it for security monitoring. Um, now what is also interesting is that we have some research results that show you once this switch has been made, how unlikely it is that people will ever turn it off. And I'm going to show you an example in a minute. What I'm going to show you is users switching to using Google 8888. Um, do you remember that there was this uh, uh, censorship problem in Turkey and people spray painted uh, like with uh, uh, 8888 on buildings and told people go use Google because they don't censor? Um, what also happens is that people tell other people to use Google if their local ISP has a problem, which we had in the Netherlands a couple of years ago. We have a provider called Ziggo, which is a large cable ISP. Uh, and uh, I'm actually a customer of Ziggo um, because we have, we, have, we have only a few big ISPs in the Netherlands. They suffered a denial of service attack on their DNS resolvers. And that basically meant if you were using their DNS resolvers, which most, most people are not like me, they don't run their own resolver. Um, and they were using Ziggo's and that stopped working. So basically their internet stopped working because if you can't turn names into addresses, your internet is broken. Um, what happened is that the, the Dutch public broadcasting service, the, the, the uh, public TV station said, oh, if you're suffering from this attack, don't worry. This is how you switch to using Google. And we, actually, we could actually, we were, it, it happened, we were doing a measurement for a study at that time. Uh, and um, what you uh, see in this graph is traffic that is coming uh, from the Ziggo network into Google. And read the paper if you want to know how we know who is querying Google. Um, but the takeaway is this, this is um, round about where the attack happened. And people switch to Google. And they never switch back. So if people make this switch, the lesson from this is if people change their configuration, they're, because it works, they're unlikely to turn it back off. <laughs> Has anybody seen this little pop-up dialogue in their Firefox? If you have, come talk to me. Um, this is how... Firefox informs users about the switch to DUH. When you install the new version, they ask you, we give you more secure encrypted DNS. Just press OK. Otherwise, disable protection. I mean, who in their right mind is going to disable protection, right? <laughs> but you really have to ask yourself whether that is the case. Because right now, 
Mozilla has an agreement with Cloudflare. Uh, there is a good privacy policy, and you may be entirely fine using that service. Um, but will it stay that way? Cloudflare recently went public. They had an IPO, so they went uh, to the stock exchange and they sold stock to investors. Um, and what if investors say, ooh, you have this DNS resolver. We learn a lot about internet users from that. Why don't you monetize that? Um, so that might change in the future. But hey, you already switched, and like I showed you, you are never going to switch back. Which is why I take issue with Mozilla making this decision for us. Um, oh, and remember that performance argument? Firefox, actually, there is a blog, link in the slides, again, slides will be shared, uh, where they compared classic DNS to DOH. Oh, the, by the way, DNS people hate me if I call it classic DNS, but you have to call it something. Um, there are some really nice weasel words in that blog. Oh, the slowest 20% of exchanges radically improved, and the majority of exchanges have a little bit of extra overhead, making them just a little bit slower. Well, that a little bit slower was an average of six milliseconds per query, extra. Uh, if you visit uh, spiegel.de, you uh, do a lot of DNS queries. If uh, six milliseconds extra for every query is something you will notice. 15 there is research that shows that 15% of the page load time for a web page is DNS lookups. Um, Think of these network operators. I, like I told you before, with DNS over TLS, if you encrypt traffic, you can no longer do security monitoring. This is even worse with DOH because it mixes normal tra uh, web traffic with DNS traffic. Uh, it circumvents the local security policy because it starts talking to something in the cloud. Um, and uh, I really feel for the poor security officers in enterprise environments that now have to um, change browser configs to disable DNS over HTTPS. And I predict that Firefox will be banned on enterprise desktops because of this. Because if you are running a company, your employees are handling sensitive data. That means you have a responsibility for how they work with their computers. Um, this doesn't hold for you as, a, uh, um, as an individual or maybe as a student or a researcher here, but if you work for a company, uh, the IT department has to care about your security. Yes? Yes, they do. Yeah. Okay, so the remark is that what Mozilla tells companies to do is insert a certain dummy domain in their DNS resolver, and if that exists, it, Firefox will turn off DOH. So the perfect denial of service to turn off your privacy setting. <laughs> you, that, you see the problem with that, right? Uh, uh, well, if I want people that are in my network not to use DOH because I'm interested in snooping on their traffic, I just make sure that that domain exists. Yes, that's easy to do. Yeah. But I, I think that enterprises are not going to bother with that. They're just going to ban Firefox from desktops. All, man, all managed desktops, no more Firefox. All Chrome now. Or Edge. Personally, I would say use Edge because Microsoft cares a lot more about privacy than Google does. Um, I want to sort of finish uh, because I don't know what... Yeah, that's about right. Okay, so I want to sort of finish talking about the impact that DOH has on the DNS namespace. Because that is where I expect there to be the biggest impact, and it may not be obvious. I showed you what, what the word resolverless, which apparently the dictionary doesn't know. Um, and um, remember that I showed you that. So DOH may actually radically change the DNS namespace. Right now, the DNS namespace looks like this. We have a root at the top, which is managed by ICANN. Then we have top-level domains like .de, .com, .net, .org, etc. And if I want to register a domain, I can go to what is called a registrar. Um, and uh, I pay a few euros, and I have my own domain name. How many of you have your own domain name? Good people. Now... The browser vendors floated the idea of a repository of trusted recursive resolvers that can be used for looking up specific parts of the namespace. 
Does anybody know what the cap forum is? Hands? Okay. Maybe it goes too far to explain that because then I need to, to explain public key infrastructure and uh, certificates, etc. The cap forum is a cabal. It's a group of people from uh, the browser community and from the certificate authority community and they decide among each other which certificates the browser on your system is going to trust. You don't, well, you can make changes yourself, but you don't decide what gets installed in your operating system. A very small group of people decides that. Imagine that a small group of people decides how you will be doing your name lookups in the future. Um, but that is uh, uh, suddenly what might happen. They might decide how you will re resolve names in the future. Who gave them the right to change that? We had the DNS, which was managed by the internet community, and now we have a very small group of people, potentially, who can change this. Um, so imagine the consequences of that. If part of the namespace are directly resolved through the browser, we circumvent the current DNS. That means that we might end up with names that only exist in these TRRs, trusted recursive, they, don't, they no longer exist on the public internet, they only exist in this space. Oh, and if I'm Google or Cloudflare and I have one of these trusted recursive resolvers, and you are one of my customers, I give you a name for free. Why not? Um, but what does it mean for the level playing field? How do I claim my name? I used to have my own domain, and now somebody can just start using uh, a similar name within Cloudflare, and I never know because it's not on the public internet. Uh, ICANN, the people that manage the current DNS hierarchy, might become obsolete, which is ironic because the author of the DNS over HTTPS RFC is somebody from ICANN. Um, but it also encourages further centralization of the Internet. The Internet is already a lot of Google and a lot of Cloudflare and a lot of Amazon and a lot of Akamai and very little people running their own services on there. Now, this is a natural result of the internet becoming a more mature technology with requirements of being available 24-7, etc., etc. But this drives centralization further. Um, another issue is that it might drive current DNS operators out of business because they, are, they have an infrastructure that's really good at handling UDP packets really fast. So one packet goes, one packet back. They're really good at that. Uh, if you look at, like I said, .com handles 200 billion queries uh, a day. They don't break a sweat. Right? This is a huge amount of requests that they can handle. Um, if they have to, to change to doing this over HTTP, we have a problem because it, that brings all of the resource requirements that you need to run a web server. Um, and it requires major re-engineering for what we call traditional DNS players. So this could change the market completely. Um, and now there is a working group. Yes? There's, there's the other problem. Always I wash software but which is uh, which have, has to uh, look up some DNS name. I have also to use this whole have HTTP stack. And if I don't need that, I have also yeah. So the, so the question or the remark is about what are the consequences for software implementers. Now, if I want to look up a name uh, on a Unix system, I, I call get host by name, which is a system call to, to map uh, a host name to an IP address. Uh, and now I have to start using HTTPS. Yes, that's true, but um, libraries are already popping up to help you do that. Um, another problem, though, is that... Um, Right now, applications use the system resolver. So they call a system call, get host by name, to do a lookup. In DNS over HTTPS, every application can start doing its own DNS resolving. So that means if uh, I have a phone with lots of apps, every app might be using a different DNS over HTTPS resolver, which gives me no control whatsoever over my privacy anymore because I don't know, this app is using that resolver, that app is using that resolver. How the hell am I going to manage that as a user? I completely lose track of that. Sure, this started in the browser community and right now it's only really supported in the browser community, but you can wait for the moment that apps start doing this as well. And then we have a problem. So it's not hard for them to do it. The problem is it's easy for app developers to start doing their own DNS and that's a problem. Is that? Have to want to have dependency on 
dependencies on the whole HTTP stack because uh, more software or more stack or more yeah, stack. Yeah, but this, you, you grab a library that does this for you. <coughs> you grab a library that does this for you. I mean, you don't have to write your own stuff for that. Maybe you don't want to be dependent on that, but then you are a conscientious app developer. <laughs> um, so the IETF is already uh, dealing with this. There is a new uh, working group called ABCD. This is IETF humor. Um, application behavior considering DNS. And the first draft uh, from uh, no, 1st of November last year called Adaptive DNS Improving Privacy of Name Resolution. It sounds really innocuous and sounds really nice. That is the first draft that really suggests splitting up the namespace and uh, telling clients that for certain parts of the namespace, you can, you can put a DNS record in there that says, oh, you should talk to this DOH resolver. So this is already happening. The standards are already in development. Okay, so what will the future look like? Um, so there's no reason to assume that the browser people, especially the Mozilla people, are not doing this with the best intentions. But the cat is now out of the uh, box, right? So we don't really know, we, we can't put it back in. DOH is out there and it's going to have consequences for the namespace. Um, that hasn't happened in over 30 years. DNS has remained very much unchanged in how we use it since it was introduced in the 1980s. Um, so we should be really be paying close attention to what is happening here, especially as uh, concerned internet users. So what can and should you do? Um, if you run a, a DNS resolver, even if it's just your own DNS resolver, just turn on DNS over TLS, it's easy. All the software supports it. Um, consider running DNS over HTTPS so that we get more diversity. So it's not just Cloudflare that supports this or it's not just Google that supports this. Um, and this is not simple because there is insufficient open source code available right now, but we're working on this and I'll show you in a minute. Also, if you're interested, get involved in the debate. Talk to people about this. If you know people at Mozilla or Firefox, talk to them. Tell them how you feel about this. Um, the open source people are now all working on supporting DNS over HTTPS so that, uh, like, oh, for example, also ISPs can deploy it or internet freedom organizations can deploy DNS over HTTPS. Um, so at Anelnet Labs, we are uh, um, integrating DOH support in Unbound, uh, and we're actually supported by Mozilla, uh, well, a grant from Mozilla to do that, which is kind of funny. Um, and we are also building web server plugins for the Apache web server and for Nginx, which allows you to run a DOH endpoint in your web server so you can do this mixing of traffic. Because again, say for example, you run an internet freedom website of which there are quite a few, and you want to also offer uh, DNS over HTTPS to people that uh, start using it, like for example, journalists. Um, Bind, the people from ISC are also, uh, got, also got a grant from Mozilla, so they're also integrating uh, DOH support. Uh, it was not that Mozilla came to us and said, oh, we will give you money if you do your DOH. We actually asked for that money. Uh, PowerDNS has a tool called DNSDist that already supports DOH, uh, not the people from the Czech Republic or Czechia as they prefer to be called now I think, uh, are also working on support for DOH. That was, I told you a lot about DNS privacy, I hope that the message about DOH sort of stuck. If you have any questions let me know, thank you for your attention. And uh, I was allowed to say that we are, because we're a not-for-profit, that we are looking for a C developer. <laughs> no knocking? <laughs> the first time that happened to me, I, just, I freaked out, what's happening? <laughs> Funny story, the knocking is not normal in Dutch uh, universities. No, when I went there the first time, I wanted to knock after the lecture. <laughs> Everyone was looking at me, what the hell is he doing? <laughs> and he said, ah, oh, he's German. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks a lot for that interesting talk.
Uh, we still have some time for some questions and discussions. So uh, if you have a question or uh, want to put in an argument, please raise your voice. And I'll try to stick around a, a bit as well. Yeah. Uh, you first. Yeah, no, no, no. no. Yeah, sure. Uh, no. Um, okay, DNSSEC. So DNSSEC is the DNS security extensions. This is about uh, guaranteeing in, uh, integrity and authenticity of responses that you get. So basically it means digitally signing the data that is in the DNS. And uh, you can use this to figure out if people have been trying to change your DNS response while it is going to you. Uh, and to prevent what is called a cache poisoning attack. It has nothing to do with privacy because all it just means is it adds integrity to the DNS. Uh, and DNSSEC is definitely not uh, uh, obsolete. It is used a lot, but it is used... It's not used evenly across the Internet. Uh, for example, uh, there, are, there are a lot of DNSSEC signed domains in the Netherlands, I think also in Germany, but if you look at .com, Less than 1% of the domains in .com use DNSSEC. Uh, but DNSSEC really is a security feature that adds authenticity. Now, you can bootstrap stuff on that, uh, which is actually really interesting, which is um, why it's popular with, for example, the BSI in Germany, um, because you can bootstrap email security on top of DNSSEC. If you send an email... Um, Again, email is a protocol from the 1980s, SMTP. Uh, and it works over port 25, it is just TCP, it's not encrypted. So if I send an email and I intercept that connection, I can see the email you sent. Now, that's undesirable, right? So they extended the protocol to support TLS with something called start TLS. And what it means is if I connect to an email server, I can tell that server, oh, please start the TLS section first and then I will send you the email. The problem with that is that I need to check that the certificate that that server gives me is the legitimate certificate so that I know I'm talking to that server and not somebody who's sitting in the middle and is impersonating that server. Uh, another thing is that start TLS is something that you start after you set up the connection. So again, if I put a man in the middle who just says, mm, start TLS, I don't support TLS, just talk to me, there's no way for me to tell that. What you can do is you can put a record in the DNS, you DNSSEC sign that, and that record says, this server has this certificate. Now, when I connect to it, and it doesn't give me a certificate, I know something is wrong, because I know from the DNS there should be a certificate. If it gives me a different certificate, again, I know something is wrong. So DNSSEC is actually was intended to, in, to add authenticity and integrity to the DNS itself. Many people didn't really care about that, but, DNS but mail security is something that people care about a lot. Uh, and uh, the, the German federal mail standard uh, actually mandates that you should use this. Uh, and they were one of the first in the world to do that. Um, and we have something similar in the Netherlands. So something completely different, but useful nevertheless. There was another question there. Yes. Who and why would Well, imagine um, uh, uh, if you are at an airport or in a Starbucks or whatever, they block lots of ports. So they only open ports that they want you to use. Why would they? Uh, 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 they might, for example, block this port because it's not known to them. So that might be just unintentional. But if I want you to, uh, say you are in my network and I want you to only use my DNS resolver and not some other resolver that sits outside the network, but it supports DNS over TLS. So say you are, um, I don't know, uh, what's the sensitive area? You're in a prison. You're visiting somebody there and they have a Wi-Fi network. Um, and they want to see what you, DNS requests you're sending out just to monitor what you're doing in there. Then they can just block, you could talk to Google because they support DNS over TLS, so you could configure your device to do that. But if they just block port 853, you cannot talk TLS to Google. You, can, you may still be able to talk to Google over normal DNS, but then, hey, they can intercept it and they can still see what you're asking. Um, port 443, which we use for HTTPS, 
that is used, you can't just block that port. You might be able to block traffic to a certain destination on that port, but you can't just block port 443 because then you break, most websites now use HTTPS. So you break half the internet if you do that. Does that answer your question? Yeah, unfortunately, we're not there yet. <laughs> <laughs> then we have to start. <laughs> yes, uh, the, uh, the, I fully agree. Everybody should deploy that now, DNS over TLS. Uh, and uh, also DNS over HTTPS, because we need diversity. Uh, I think we've passed the point where uh, we can still say that DOH is a bad idea. Uh, it, that's that station, we passed that station. Yeah. I'm a little bit confused because you pointed out all the problems that the DNS over HTTP has, and then later on moved on uh, to promote us to put up more DNS over HTTP. Yes. How does that add up? Because it, the cat's already out of the bag. This, this protocol is going to get used no matter what, because it's in Firefox, it's in Chrome, uh, so it will be in Edge soon. People are going to be using it. If people are going to be using it, let's make sure there is a diversity of servers that they can use, right? Because if that does not happen, people are going to use either Cloudflare or Google. Uh, and that's not an internet I want to live in um, because the internet is more than Cloudflare and Google. Um, so that's why we need diversity, right? The cat's out of the bag. I can, I can argue for hours about why DOH is bad and why it's a layer violation and why it's a, an architectural disaster. But that's, we've already passed that point. Yeah, that's a good question. So um, the question was, what do I think about DNS over Quick? Do people know, hands up, who knows what Quick is? Okay, about well, half room. So Quick is an encrypted transport over UDP. Quick was originally developed by Google, but it's now an IETF standard. So it's just a transport protocol. Uh, and I think DNS over Quick is actually very interesting because it gives you some of the speed benefits that you have with UDP. Um, it also has some of the privacy risks, for example, with a zero uh, RTT session resumption, where, again, you become trackable. Um, but I definitely think there should be DNS over Quick. I think there's already an internet draft circulating. Uh, but DNS over Quick is definitely interesting. Um, I don't know what port they propose to use for it, uh, whether it's a separate port or not. Uh, if it isn't, it might be even more interesting because then you can't simply block it and it might be a really good alternative to DNS over HTTPS. It will definitely cost fewer resources than DNS over HTTPS. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, Yes, they could. No, not, not necessarily. Uh, what it means is that even if I configure, for example, Firefox, if I don't want my traffic to be sent to Cloudflare, uh, I could go into the configuration settings of Firefox. And for those of you who've never tried, in your address bar, do type about colon config. Uh, and then you get into the, the like the, the the detailed configuration settings, and this is where you can change this. Um, so I could change the setting in Firefox, but then if every app packages their own DNS resolving, those app developers are probably going to be lazy, and they're all going to send it to Cloudflare because it just works, or Google because it just works. Um, maybe a little sidetrack on that. It is apparently now so common for people to configure Google as the default resolver on their phones or on their laptops that um, I have a student who is doing research into uh, streaming service unblockers. Uh, and a streaming service unblocker is, say I want to, I have a Netflix subscription, but I can of course only see if I'm here in Germany and I have a German account, I can see German, the content that Netflix Germany has, but not all of the content they have in the US which is really frustrating because I'm paying and I want to see that content too. 
So then you go to one of these unblocking services and they do a little bit of magic with the DNS, they do a little bit of magic with the TLS proxy and suddenly I can watch content in the US. Those content unblockers intercept traffic to 8888 if you use their VPN service because so many people have configured this by default on their system. So. <laughs> Um, <laughs> good question. Of course, it's better to one if you if you want to use so actually, I'm not going to say Cloudflare is bad because I know uh, quite a few people who work on that team at Cloudflare and they have good intentions. But Cloudflare is still a U.S. company, right? So they're subject to U.S. law. Um, an interesting alternative is Quad Nine, which was set up with the idea of privacy. It's a not-for-profit organization that is headquartered in Geneva in Switzerland. So they're not subject to US law. Uh, if you want to use a public resolver, try Quad9. Uh, and unfortunately, I can't remember the IPv6 address, but of course you have to use IPv6. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, but Quad9 you, is a good one. Yeah, yeah you can also use uh, the DNS server provided by Digital Courage, uh, Internet Freedom Society Club uh, based in Bielefeld. Ah, and, there you go. And they also support uh, DOT. Excellent. They support DNS. And, uh, and Do they have an easy to remember address? <laughs> I, just, no. I don't think right so, now. but <laughs> if you set it up one time, you will never change it again, no, so that's just that's stick to that address. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, the Stubby project have a list of... Yes. Uh, yeah, so there is a dns-privacy.org, uh, and uh, the people that build Stubby uh, run that website, and it has a list of resolvers that you can use, and that support DNS over TLS, and some description of those resolvers, if they have them, a link to the privacy policy, etc. So, yeah. Any other questions? Yeah, there, there have been numerous attempts of that, like things like Namecoin and peer-to-peer uh, um, -peer things that used BitTorrent. Um, none of them really took off because uh, it doesn't really scale if you have to, 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 to distribute the, the whole namespace over that. Uh, you need quite a bit of critical mass to do that. The problem is DNS is very, very efficient. It works really well. And all of these alternatives require quite a lot of resources. They require quite a lot of buy-in. DNS is built into every operating system. Right? Even the cheapest IoT shit has a DNS resolver incorporated in it. Uh, and that's also because DNS is a, is a very simple protocol. And it's also e really easy to get it wrong, but I can also talk about that for hours. Um, the, the momentum is against you if you want to change this to something completely different. The, the, um, we've seen that with, uh, there was a question about DNSSEC before, I don't know who asked it, but there was a question about DNSSEC. Um, DNSSEC is far from an ideal protocol, but because it is backward compatible with DNS, that is what is getting deployed. There is a very smart guy called Daniel Bernstein who developed an alternative, which was actually technically much better, um, but because uh, he didn't want to go through the standards process in the ITF, etc., that fell on the ground, right? The, the inertia was against him. People want something that's backward compatible, part of the existing ecosystem. Before you can get something running like that, uh, it, it, that's really not going to fly. I mean, there might be a few really privacy-conscious people who use, who route their DNS requests through Tor or do something like that. Um, those people already know what they need to do in order to protect themselves. Um, and and it, I don't see an alternative to DNS as a technology really taking off anytime soon. Um, there is a whole network paradigm called name, named data networking where they're saying, oh, this whole internet model that we have with IP is outdated and it's really 
I want to talk to a surface because I know the name of the surface, so why don't we make that the center of the network? That's been an academic project for at least 15 years, and it's not seeing any deployment because their market simply has no incentive to spend money deploying that. Because the internet, with all of its flaws, the internet that we have works. Uh, and unfortunately, we're stuck with it. Um, any other questions? Okay, thank you very much. Oh, ooh, one more, okay, go on, go on, go on, because you have a blue shirt. <laughs> and you have a rootinator rocket on your shirt, that's really good. Uh, would you recommend uh, setting up your own resolver for a, a home network? Would, so, okay, the question is, would I recommend setting up uh, your own resolver for your home network? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> because I run one myself, but yeah. If everyone would do that, is that good for DNS, bad for DNS? Okay, the question is, if everybody would do that, would that be bad for the DNS? Um, even in your own home network, there's still quite a bit of caching, uh, so it's not necessarily bad for... The DNS can handle that, trust me, because people throw DDoS attacks at the DNS that is far more traffic than whatever all of the home users combined do. Uh, if you have a Raspberry Pi, uh, you can install PiHole, uh, which comes with uh, Unbound. Uh, and uh, a nice dashboard, a web-based dashboard that you can use to configure it. You can run your, your, you can completely run your own DNS resolver. You can run a DNS resolver as a forwarder that talks to your ISP, but it caches locally. Uh, and it can even talk DNS over TLS to your, uh, up to your uh, ISP resolver, which if all the other devices in your house don't support it, still means it protects you because then your pie hole does this for you. So yes, run your own resolver. <laughs> and it's a fantastic ad blocker. Yes, it is. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? So, Vern. Thank you for your time. Thanks a lot, Roland. You're welcome. And thank you all for attending here. If you're interested in this kind of topics, you can join our, our regular meetings of the Chaos Ref every week. Uh, we are talking a lot about of these types of topics, uh, especially security regarding topics and networking. So please feel free to, to, join, to join us and uh, drop in. And then again, thank you and have a nice evening.